We are now recording today's lecture from the College of American Pathologists. Today, we're gonna to be talking about genomic pathology in practice. And this is gonna be part one of a two-part series. We need to start, as I do every single lecture, with our standard legal disclosure. These lectures are designed to supplement your current training program. Content provided in each lecture is at the discretion of the presenter. The CAP did not assist in the development of the content, nor does the CAP indicate these lectures will fulfill any program requirements. Please consult with your program director to determine applicability. Today, for the first part of a two-part series, we have with us Dr. Jason Rosenbaum. Dr. Rosenbaum is Assistant Professor of Pathology and Laboratory Medicine and Director of the Molecular Genetic Pathology Fellowship. He is at the hospital of the University of Pennsylvania. Dr. Rosenbaum, we are delighted to have you with us. I'm gonna pass you control and then I'll let you know when we can see your slides and everything's working. And while we're doing that changeover, I'm going to inform our audience that Dr. Rosenbaum has agreed that it is all right to take screenshots and to live tweet his lecture. Dr. Rosenbaum, we are seeing your slides beautifully. Um, get your, take yourself off mute and I'll let you know if I can hear you. Thank you, Ken. That's perfect. It's all yours. Thank you, everybody, and thank you to the college for um, hosting this series. I think it's a really, it's been a really valuable um, resource over the course of the last few months, and I'm glad that it's going to continue, and I'm glad that I have the opportunity to participate. Um, before we get started, I just want to mention that I did uh, present for the ASCP Virtual Path Grand Round series um, about a month ago, a little less than a month ago. Some of the slides in the current presentation are similar or, in fact, identical, um, but the uh, organization of the talk and the points um, being made are, are somewhat different. And so uh, I hope any of you that are tuning in that tuned into the prior talk, um, uh, stay with it and, and, uh, and get um, additional value out of it. Okay, so let's go ahead. So the goals for today uh, are to get you to the point where you understand what can be detected by massively parallel sequencing, uh, which is abbreviated MPS. It's also known as next generation sequencing or NGS. Um, when I'm teaching, I prefer to use the term massively parallel sequencing because the words massively and parallel uh, mean something and convey what the testing actually is. Um, whereas the words next and generation don't really carry any meaning. Um, I don't care what anybody else calls it. And in fact, in conversation, I, I refer to it as NGS quite frequently. Um, this is just a distinction I tend to make when I'm teaching uh, because I find the term more informative. Um, we'd also like to get you to the point where you understand what the test output looks like. Essentially, um, uh, anybody in or out of uh, pathology knows, ha has some basic understanding of what it means to look into a microscope. Um, we'd like you to have at least a minimal sense of what it means to look at sequencing data. <clears throat> Uh, more broadly, and sort of a goal of the two talks together, um, is uh, I'd like you to be able to um, consider what sort of design considerations um, affect an, an MPS-based test. Um, so how could you make it faster? What do you sacrifice to make it faster? Things like that. Um, another way to frame the same question is to ask how do different assays compare? Um, and this can be important whether you're uh, running these tests or interpreting them or simply um, uh, absorbing them into your own reports. Um, it is uh, uh, worth knowing what the differences are between your in-house assay and the send out option, for example. Um, We'd uh, like you to uh, uh, understand some basic concepts of how the sequencing data are interpreted, um, what's the role of people in, in this um, system that does use a lot of computational tools. And um, at the uh, end of the day, uh, I'd like you to appreciate um, 
how you would go about either generating, interpreting, or integrating a sequencing report in your own practice. So some context, um, nothing that we do in the, in the sequencing world would be possible without the Human Genome Project. Um, here you see the two seminal publications from February of 2001 in Science and Nature um, and Mr. DNA from Jurassic Park uh, presenting them. Um, the Human Genome Project was a massive undertaking. Uh, the idea at the time was to uh, catalog all three billion base pairs of the human genome um, and establish a reference sequence against which um, uh, individuals could be compared. The tools available at the time, the best tool available at the time was Sanger sequencing. Um, I'm not going to spend a lot of time. Um, if you understand Sanger sequencing, this may be uh, something of a refresher. Uh, if you don't, um, hopefully this will give you a, a baseline understanding. Um, Sanger sequencing involves the progressive incorporation of nucleotides that are labeled with a dye terminator. And so the, um, the dye fluoresces a specific color and it prevents the extension of the sequence. And so you can, uh, if the uh, nucleotides are mixed together such that some of the nucleotides are labeled and some are unlabeled, you'll get a mixture of different fragments of different lengths with different colored labels at each end. And so here you see a sequence of two nucleotides labeled in green and then three nucleotides labeled in red. And if you run these nucleotides out on a gel, these fragments out on a gel, you can resolve both by color and by space, by, by length of the sequence, um, what the actual sequence of the, of the uh, original sequence is. So here we have A and T, and you can continue to extend this um, uh, several hundred base pairs. So Sanger sequencing detects by color and size, um, and that was the available technology at the time of the Human Genome Project. But as you might imagine, um, this gel mechanism uh, imposes some constraints because the gel it, it takes up physical space. And if you're going to sequence 300, or 3 billion base pairs, several hundred base pairs at a time, uh, you're going to need a lot of gels. And if you want to do it in parallel, you'll need um, several large buildings full of gels in order to do that. And so massively parallel sequencing was born out of a necessity to miniaturize and um, sequence uh, DNA fragments in parallel at scale. Uh, and it was driven by the needs of the Human Genome Project. So the Human Genome Project, though, was completed uh, almost 20 years ago, or the first draft of it was completed almost 20 years ago. So why um, don't we have 20 years worth of clinical experience in the sequencing space? It's really more like 10 at the most. Um, one of the reasons is that the clinical need um, didn't become uh, prominent until more recently. And that's because um, any uh, tissue has a limitation on the amount of nucleic acid it can provide. And um, as a sort of secondary effect of the Human Genome Project, there became an in increasing need to test more loci in a given disease state. Um, and the example I give here is the IASCLC CAP AMP guidelines from 2018 either require or strongly recommend uh, EGFR, ALK, ROS1, KRAS, BRAF, RET, MET, and ERBB2, which is also known as HER2, um, be analyzed in uh, any patient. And um, adding complexity to this is that uh, full analysis of all these genes requires detection not just of single nucleotide variants, which is what people traditionally think of as a mutation, um, but also insertions and deletions, rearrangements or fusions, and copy number changes like amplification of HER2. At the same time as, the, as this increasing need to test more genes and more loci um, 
uh, grew, um, there also grew a need to accommodate ever smaller and ever poorer specimens. Um, if you're uh, familiar with anatomic pathology, then you know that um, over the years, tech biopsy technology, interventional radiology, FNAs, et cetera, have gotten better and more accurate. And um, we're able to, or we're asked to work from smaller and smaller bits of tissue. While smaller and smaller bits of tissue then also um, provide smaller and smaller amounts of DNA, which becomes problematic if you're um, operating in standalone single assays. So into that context comes massively parallel sequencing, which uh, after a sort of phase in which it expanded into the research realm, um, costs started to come down. And um, often uh, the massively parallel sequencing version of an assay um, will have superior performance characteristics compared to standalone assays. Not every characteristic, but many, um, usually most notably specificity. Uh, but the most important factor driving the clinical update of the, uh, uptake of the technology is that a massively parallel sequencing assay under the right circumstances can use as little as 50 nanograms of total nucleic acid, which allows you to get much, much, much more data out of the same material. And so I wanna take a moment here to illustrate a, a concept from business school. Uh, I did not go to business school, but um, I, I know people who did. Um, and um, nevertheless, uh, the concept here is um, also understood commonly that if you're offering a product or a service, there are three parameters you can maximize. You can maximize the speed at which you deliver the service, you can maximize the quality of the service, uh, or you can maximize the cost effectiveness, in effect, minimizing the cost of the service. And uh, the rule of thumb is that you get to pick two of these things, and that's why the, tr the corners of the triangle are highlighted. Uh, this is commonly illustrated using food, where fast food is fast and cheap. Um, food you have uh, at a fancy restaurant is fast and good, um, comparatively fast. I mean, it wouldn't be as fast as McDonald's, but it's certainly faster than cooking at home, which is your cheap and good option. Uh, and so at each point in the corner, you're making a sacrifice. If you're uh, operating in the fast food realm, you're lowering the quality. If you're operating in the fancy restaurant realm, you're uh, elevating the cost. And if you're operating in the home cooked meal realm, you are sacrificing speed for cost and quality. And um, this concept is commonly understood out in the real world, but somehow um, when we enter uh, med medicine, and particularly when we enter lab medicine, um, this concept gets forgotten. And a lot of people try to achieve the perfect balance of all three uh, parameters. And you, you can do that. There's nothing preventing you from trying to be in the middle of the triangle, but it's kind of a trap because the reason it doesn't work in the real world um, applies in medicine as well. The reason it doesn't work in the real world is that if you're in that golden triangle, um, everybody looks at your product and sees what could be better they look at your perfectly balanced product and say, well, I could have gotten it faster if I did it somewhere else, or I could have gotten it cheaper using somebody else, or uh, this other service offers better quality. Um, and so uh, I want you to keep in mind the balance here as we move through um, the talk today and on Thursday, um, because it comes back multiple times. So what we're doing is really simple in concept. Just like the Human Genome Project, we're taking fragments of sequence DNA. We're aligning those fragments to the reference sequence. And we're re regenerating the patient sequence. Um, and the example I'm going to show you, the analogy I'm going to show you, um, is meant not to condescend to you, but to uh, minimize anxiety. Because 
uh, at the end of the day, this is a very, very complex workflow with a lot of intricacies. Um, but uh, it really boils down to this very simple concept, which can be illustrated with a pile of Legos that you follow the directions and build a model. And uh, I'm particularly fond of using this model because uh, I'm a, a white male born in 1976, but um, I, I also like the use of this model to illustrate the concept that the human genome is not completely understood. And in fact, it's not even completely uh, uh, sequenced. Uh, it's still uh, in a draft version, draft 38 currently and um, will probably continue to be in a draft version um, for as long as I'm alive, at least. So the, these um, gray bars represent the data that we're looking at. And what you're seeing here is an image capture from a piece of software called Integrative Genomics Viewer, which is free to download from the Broad Institute. It's commonly used in our field, or similar software is commonly used in our field that lets you visualize sequencing data. So as I said, the gray bars represent the individual se sequenced pieces of DNA. At the bottom, this rainbow colored uh, strip is the reference genome. It's not really a rainbow, it's four colors, each color representing the um, uh, an individual nucleotide, A, C, T, or G. At the top, you see a chromosomal map. Um, the red hash mark indicates where we are in the chromosome. This happens to be chromosome two. Uh, the red blowout lines I've added in to help illustrate what you're looking at, but they are not present in the software natively. At the bottom of the image, you see the, the three letter code ALK. That is the gene that, um, that lives in this region. And the thick blue bars represent the exons of ALK, that is the coding sequence of ALK. The thin blue lines represent um, the introns. And if your screen is big enough, you can see that there are arrowheads pointing from right to left. And that indicates the direction of transcription of the gene, which can be important for interpretation. So what can we detect with massively parallel sequencing? Nearly any assay, almost by definition, uh, can detect single nucleotide variants. That's bread and butter for these assays. It's what they were originally built and designed to do, is to detect mismatches from the reference genome. Um, and this is what they look like. So uh, boxed in red is a single nucleotide variant that's present in multiple reads at the exact same position. The uh, color represents the alternate nucleotide that doesn't match the reference genome. So in this case, it's orange. Um, and uh, in boxed in purple are several other single nucleotide variants that aren't aligned so well and um, uh, might require a, a little bit deeper analysis to decide whether they actually represent uh, variants or not. The other category of genetic change or mutation that these assays um, are well built to detect are small insertions and deletions. Again, because it's fairly straightforward to detect these by comparison to the reference genome. Whoops. Uh, what you're seeing here in this view is uh, a, a typical looking deletion of 10 nucleotides from the DNMT3A gene and it's represented by a black line interrupting the gray bars of the sequencing reads. Insertions are represented a little differently. A purple hash mark is introduced into the sequencing read at the site of the insertion. And then if you click with your mouse right on the purple hash mark, you can um, read the actual sequence of the insertion. So as I said, these are detected by direct comparison to the reference genome. And again, nearly all assays uh, detect these kinds of variants to the point where I'm comfortable saying if somebody just says they're running an NGS or an MPS based assay, uh, this is what they mean. They can detect these things. Now, other types of genetic events, other types of mutations uh, can be detected with appropriate assay design, but it should not be assumed 
unless you have specific information about the assay that a given assay can detect structural variants like larger insertions and deletions or chromosomal rearrangements or copy number variants. And uh, the reason is that these variants behave differently from a computational perspective. A structural variant, um, if you want to imagine a chromosomal rearrangement, for example, an EML4 ALK uh, fusion, for example, um, the EML4 sequence matches EML4 perfectly, and the ALK sequence matches ALK perfectly. Um, the problem is that the sequence isn't where it should be, not that it doesn't match the reference genome. And so it requires somewhat different techniques to detect these. Similarly, with copy number changes, like if you want to imagine a HER2 amplification, um, the problem isn't that anything mismatches, and the problem isn't really that anything is in the wrong place. The problem is that there's too much. And so um, you need a, a, a tool here for these kinds of variants um, that is good at quantitating and isn't actually concerned with the reference genome um, at all. You can get really fancy with these assays, as I'm sure most of you have heard examples. Um, you can look at expression data, you can look at metamutational data, uh, tumor mutational burden has just got a FDA approval, so there's been a lot of uh, interest in that all of a sudden again. Um, uh, you can distinguish whether a variant is somatic or germline, you can detect integrated viruses into the DNA of a cancer specimen. You can do a whole lot of other things. But none of this, sh again, should be assumed uh, unless you know that the assay can detect it, unless somebody told you or you read in the assay description. And the reason for that is partly because um, some things, uh, but because of time, you know, tumor mutational burden became more and more important over time. But some of it is because by adding in the capacity to do more things, you may be making the test either more expensive or slower at the expense of quality. And um, you really need to assess when you're designing these assays, how much, how important, how much clinical benefit do you get out of doing these extra things? Um, and what are you sacrificing for the things your assay already does well? So clinically, the uh, advantages of using massively parallel sequencing in contrast to some other approach uh, are that it is massively parallel. Um, it generates much more data at the same time than a standalone assay. And uh, yeah. uh, but perhaps more importantly, it's capable of resolving different kinds of data at the same time, which is often difficult for standalone assays where, um, again, to use ALK as an example, uh, you may need to uh, uh, assess it by fish in order to detect chromosomal rearrangement, and then by a different assay to detect single nucleotide resistance uh, variants. The disadvantages, um, I put in quotes because they're arguable, um, the disadvantages of massively parallel sequencing are that it is slow and that it is expensive. And uh, I just want to make it clear that it really depends on what your alternative is and what are your clinical needs. So in myeloproliferative neoplasms, you may have a very simple algorithm that just requires testing of JAK2 V617F. And I would be the first person to uh, argue with that or agree with you that um, you can do perfectly well with a standalone single gene assay if this is all you need, and you'd be better off because it would be faster and cheaper. But the issue is that um, often we're testing these things in algorithms where uh, if someone tests positive for one thing, then you stop. But if they test negative, you have um, a decision tree and multiple uh, other assays that may need to be administered. As a rule of thumb, there's some literature to support the idea that MPS is cost effective per unit when replacing approximately three standalone assays. Um, 
an effective comparison of turnaround time is a bit more complex because it depends on whether you would order everything up front or whether you would proceed down um, a stepwise algorithm or whether you do some kind of mixture of, of the two strategies. And it's also important to consider the global cost effectiveness of the platform. That is to say, if you're bringing on a test that's capable of detecting innumerable things, um, rare, rare disease testing may become cost effective uh, because you're already sequencing that material, um, where a standalone assay might not be cost effective. Sorry. Um, also, it's worth considering that um, this uh, cost effectiveness calculation of three standalone assays um, doesn't really take into account initial investment costs, such as um, an expensive piece of equipment or um, specialized personnel like bioinformaticians. And so again, we come to the triangle of, of quality that um, you really need to uh, have a good understanding of what it is you're trying to achieve by using these assays in order to understand what the best approach is. The glib answer to the question, what can you test, is that you can test anything involving nucleic acids, uh, DNA or RNA. And that illustrates the point that I, I, I think is really important, that NGS, MPS, is a technique. It's not an assay per se. And if you hear somebody saying, well, we're gonna, send, we're gonna do NGS on this patient, it is about as meaningful as saying we're going to do radiology on this patient or we're going to do microscopy on this patient. It's not completely meaningless, but it's also not very informative. Uh, you need to know a bit more about what your MPS assay is capable of detecting, what it's built for, what it's not built for, in order to know whether that, um, an MPS assay is even advisable in your clinical circumstance. Broadly speaking, these assays are, uh, can be divided into two basic groups, two strategies, panel-based assays and exploratory assays. Panel-based assays are driven by a single diagnosis or sometimes a condition like um, a, a cardiac arrhythmia. Um, but uh, by definition, they are a limited set of genomic targets, usually represented as a gene list. Um, and they are much more common in adult medicine. That, For those of us that work in primarily adult hospitals, um, this is what we think of when we think of NGS or MPS. At the other end of the spectrum, we have exploratory assays, which tend to be agnostic to diagnosis, or at least broadly don't really consider specific diagnoses. Um, they have broad genomic coverage, usually whole exome or whole genome, um, and they, these approaches tend to be more common in pediatric medicine to the point where it used to be, it's not so much anymore, but it used to be that if um, you said a pediatric patient was getting an MPS assay, it almost certainly meant whole exome or whole genome. So examples of panel-based assays, the most common is cancer, uh, but other somatic diseases like somatic overgrowth syndromes um, can be tested in this way. Uh, prenatal testing and certain kinds of constitutional diseases, I mentioned cardiac arrhythmia before, uh, and HLA testing. In uh, the non-human nucle nucleic acid realm, uh, infectious disease can be tested by massively parallel assays um, in uh, a panel-based approach, meaning um, rather than just having a flu assay, you can have, or uh, a SARS-CoV-2 assay, you can have um, uh, an assay that interrogates uh, for the presence of any respiratory virus or respiratory virus plus bacteria or even fungi. The um, exploratory assays tend to be deployed for things like developmental delay, uh, or um, a unexplained dysmorphology. And what I mean by that is that um, uh, a child is born with um, a constellation of uh, uh, malformations or developmental delays uh, 
that appear to be syndromic. The, the, they appear to be genetic in nature, but they don't really map to a textbook definition of a disease. Um, and so the clinician might order whole exome or whole genome sequencing just to see what's there in order to see if something fits the picture. Um, and so again, it's agnostic to a specific diagnosis, it's more exploratory. And the microbiology application in this context, the analogy to infectious disease would be microbiome testing, which everybody tells me is five years away and they've told me that for the last seven or so years. And then there are other ways to deploy NGS or MPS based assays um, that uh, we're not going to go into great detail, but they don't necessarily fit neatly into either category. So uh, this image is just to reset your brain that, um, again, it's a very simple concept at its core. Uh, we're going to break it down into several sort of broad categorical steps. We start with pre-analytics and extraction, uh, that is converting the tissue to nucleic acid or extracting the nucleic acid from the tissue. Then we move to library preparation. Uh, what library preparation is, is a, uh, a chemical um, method of extracting out the sequence that you are interested in and washing away the sequence that is not informative, that is not helpful to your assay. Um, if you're doing whole genome sequencing, library preparation is not that important, um, but uh, otherwise uh, the library preparation step is critical. It is your library that will get sequenced. And um, often if if someone is giving a next, a next gen sequencing lecture or a massively parallel sequencing lecture, um, this is what they would focus on. But at the end of the day, actually, um, the sequencing technology doesn't really make that much difference. We'll talk about it a little bit, but it doesn't make a huge amount of difference to the um, outcome of your assay. Much more important are the bioinformatic tools that uh, comprise the bioinformatic pipeline. Uh, and so we will spend some time on that uh, on Thursday and then proceed to talking about inter interpretation and reporting. Every one of these steps has different decisions or different things to consider. Uh, if, e even if you're not building these assays, um, these decision points are important to understand um, even if you're just um, trying to read a report or understand what the assay did. Uh, and so we'll go through some of them, not all of them, um, uh, today and, and on Thursday. So we'll start with the decision of DNA versus RNA. This image is just taken straight from Wikipedia. It represents the central dogma of molecular biology. And just for those of you that have forgotten, uh, what I want you to take from this image is that um, DNA is separated from protein by the transcription of RNA. So DNA is transcribed to RNA, which is translated into protein. And most disease really is um, driven by protein. Um, you, you can have quite damaged DNA, but if it's never transcribed and never translated to protein, um, it, the damage to the DNA itself is meaningless. So why do we sequence from DNA if it's at best a proxy for disease? Well, DNA, um, uh, well, first of all, proteins are just very challenging to interrogate. And so you're really left with a choice of DNA or RNA uh, for the sake of uh, decoding disease. Um, DNA, in contrast to RNA, is more stable. Uh, if you've ever worked in a research lab context, you probably are aware that if you look at RNA funny, it degrades. Um, and so DNA is just a much easier substrate to work with. Um, it's more commonly used, more commonly deployed in different labs, um, which makes it easier to compare results. And importantly, DNA comes in a ratio of two alleles per cell if everything is working um, appropriately biologically. And that lets you roughly approximate the disease burden by sequencing. Uh, 
because you just um, uh, you have uh, two alleles per cell. RNA, on the other hand, uh, has some advantages. It's more accurate uh, as a picture of disease state in the sense that um, you can identify mutations that are actually being transcribed and presumably then translated into protein because it is one step closer to protein. Um, the fact that RNA is dynamically expressed, meaning quite often, especially in a disease state, um, RNA is present in far more than two transcripts per cell. That means um, RNA is a provides a much more sensitive substrate uh, than DNA often um, for detection of low levels of disease. But it's also a less accurate picture of disease state in that RNA is dynamically expressed and degraded, um, meaning this, uh, the loss of the correlation of two alleles per cell makes it quite difficult to correlate uh, a given amount of RNA with disease burden without a lot of, uh, uh, of investment of research like they did for the BCR able one fusion. The real advantage of RNA um, in the next-gen sequencing context, in the massively parallel sequencing context, is that some classes of mutations are easier to detect or confirm because introns are spliced out. And so uh, fusion genes and splicing mutations in particular are much, much easier um, from an RNA substrate than from a DNA substrate. Although it is important to point out that the bioinformatics are often more challenging. So what about sample type? Things to consider. Uh, chemical exposures during processing will result in de degradation of nucleic acid. And so the more processing that occurs for a given tissue specimen or blood specimen, um, the lower the quality of the nucleic acid. Um, the, formalin in particular is, uh, must be considered uh, quite closely. Uh, formalin does a lot of things to DNA. Here we're going to focus on um, the two most important. Um, formalin cross-links um, polymers, uh, whether they're DNA or protein or carbohydrate. Um, the way formalin actually works as a fixative is by fixing polymers to each other by cross-linking. Um, this fixation, this uh, locking of say a DNA chain to another DNA chain um, makes the DNA brittle and it leads to DNA fragmentation. Um, this uh, essentially stops with paraffinization. And so if you control, if, you, if your time in formalin is well controlled, uh, you can get a handle on the DNA fragmentation of, a, uh, of your workflow. The other thing to consider, though, that formalin also does is it deaminates cytosine. And you don't need to understand the chemistry there. Uh, what you need to understand is that it introduces um, low-level artifacts converting Cs to Ts chemically um, that were not biological mutations. These are consequences of the chemical exposure. And the important difference between this artifact and the fragmentation artifact is that um, this artifact continues to accumulate over time, even in storage. And there's very little that can be done about it at this time. Um, and so it's worth considering uh, uh, whether um, sequencing from archival specimens uh, in a clinical context is advisable. Other chemical exposures uh, can alter results as well. Decalcification uh, comes up quite a bit uh, for bony specimens or bony metastases. Acid decalcification uh, ruins DNA. You, you will not get enough good DNA uh, in order to do most massively parallel sequencing assays from an acid decalcified specimen, although there are some gentler agents that are available. So it's worth considering uh, if you're thinking about ordering an assay, thinking about um, the results you got off of an assay, um, whether an appropriate specimen type was sent or in some contexts, how old was the specimen type? 
the specimen that was sent. Um, if you have any control over your uh, histology lab's workflow, it's worth considering minimizing the time to fixation, um, the so-called cold ischemic time, and controlling the fixation time itself. And uh, it's worth considering limiting the age of, of archival specimens that you will see. Specimen quantity and quality. This is uh, often a hot topic. So how much DNA do you need to run a given assay? Well, it depends on the specimen type, which we just went over a little bit. Um, it depends on the number of nuclei. It literally depends on how much nucleic acid you can get out of a specimen, which is measured as a concentration. And what I mean by the number of nuclei is that illustrated here by two images from the same thyroid lesion. Um, the image on the left, you can imagine if an FNA needle hit that, you'd get more alleles, you'd get more DNA because you have a more cellular specimen. If the FNA um, needle hit the image on the right, or the region illustrated by the image on the right, um, you would get less DNA. Um, The minimum input of an assay also depends on how sophisticated you're trying to get. If you're just trying to call SNVs and indels, as I noted, those are bread and butter and pretty easy. Um, you can do uh, a pretty low uh, minimum nucleic acid, uh, uh, a, a lower limit. If you also want structural variants and copy number changes, because these are more complex calls to make, and in the case of copy number variants, it's a quantitative call. Um, you need more DNA to have confidence in those calls. And if you're trying to generate um, things like metamutational data, mutational signatures, or TMB, you need coverage of a lot of the genome, and that requires uh, a higher minimum input as well. All of the things we just talked about are independent of tumor content. And that is to say that um, the quality and quantity of nucleic acid that is extracted doesn't even require tumor. Not every sequencing assay is even meant for cancer. We can use NGS or MPS to detect cystic fibrosis or sickle cell or uh, any germline disease that doesn't even have a neoplastic component. So why do we assess tumor content in the context of oncology assays? The reason is for patient care. Uh, we don't want to be running assays that are unlikely to yield a result, or put another way, are going to yield a result that you, knew, you should have known from the beginning would be negative, and so are not informative. Uh, we, we want to avoid unnecessary delays of treatment, and we want to be able to pursue better specimens if they're available and do so right away and not wait necessarily uh, the week to two weeks that it would take to get the assay um, result back. Um, so, uh, yeah, a little bit of math just to illustrate this point. I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on this. If you have an assay that's about 150 genes and 500,000 base pairs of coverage and you sequence each nucleic or each uh, locus in the assay an average of a thousand times, that's 500 million base pairs uh, per specimen, base calls per specimen. If you assume an error rate even as good as one in a thousand, which is a really good error rate, that's still 500,000 errors in a given specimen. Uh, and that sounds like maybe it's okay because it's only one error per base position and you're sequencing each position a thousand times. But it's important to keep in mind that the errors are unevenly distributed across the assay. Some regions sequence poorly and some regions sequence better. And uh, given the size of these assays, it's unreasonable to validate every mutation at every position. And so we take a statistical approach and the lower limit of detection of most of these assays, uh, 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 most cancer panels of uh, reasonable size is about a 5% variant allele fraction, give or take. And so this is just to illustrate that point that this is uh, 
an IDH locus that's clinically relevant, uh, R172, um, I think. Um, it doesn't really matter. The point is that what you're seeing here is the background sequencing error rate. And uh, I hope what you take from this is that even if there were a low level mutation below the lower limit of um, detection of the assay, we wouldn't be able to distinguish it from the background sequencing error. There, there is really no way to do it. Um, and uh, so uh, if you take anything from this as an anatomic pathologist, um, understand that you're not doing the patient any favors by sending a specimen that's inadequate, that doesn't have enough tumor. We're not gonna catch anything special. The assays are not designed, they don't work like that. Um, you're really much better off saying the specimen is inadequate and helping the clinician find a better specimen or just proceed with treatment. Um, okay, uh, an important thing to point out is that the goal here is to count neoplastic nuclei, not the area of tumor. So um, it would not be unreasonable on, on this, the first week of residency um, for some, well, it wouldn't be unreasonable for someone to look at this and say, what is this? Um, but uh, it also wouldn't be unreasonable um, for a person to look at this and say, well, that's 100% tumor by area, right? Because it is, this whole thing represents tumor. But the problem is from the perspective of the DNA-based assay, what you're really concerned about is the amount of DNA that is tumor. And for those of you that aren't used to looking at images like this, these uh, dark, dense, round nuclei are lymphocytes. These big, puffy nuclei that are paler, and some of them have little white clearings, and you can often see dark nucleoli in them, these are the cancer cells. And it's still, most of the specimen is cancer, that is true, but it's not 100%, not by any stretch. You have lymphocytes here, you have fibroblasts, probably a blood vessel here, um, uh, and one way that I know I'm dealing with someone that is not um, either not trained or not taking the responsibility seriously is if I receive a specimen that claims to be 100% tumor, because there are almost always lymphocytes or some kind of vasculature in the specimen, um, and we're trying not to count those. It is possible to uh, macro dissect, to circle the region that um, you're interested in, that you believe to be more representative of tumor and try to exclude as many lymphocytes or other cells as possible. That can be done and is done at many institutions. The only thing to be aware of in that case is that the percent tumor that you should be reporting is of what you circled. It's not of the specimen overall. And I'm gonna skip this slide. Um, again, it's important to understand that overestimation of the tumor content risks resulting a negative case when the case may not necessarily be negative. There may really be mutations there. The risk is not that there will be a QNS. And we do this because uh, we feel that investing the effort, and this is expensive effort, it requires um, an MD level, you know, a pathologist to look at the slides to review them. Um, it adds at least a day, often more, to the turnaround time of these assays. The reason we do it despite those costs is because um, of the added value of not reporting out ambiguous results, ambiguous negatives. Okay, a few minutes on library preparation and sequencing, and then we'll uh, break until Thursday. So coverage, I've said coverage a couple of times. What does it mean? Coverage is literally what is included in the assay. And so for a solid tumor sequencing panel, like you see here, like what, what I operate in uh, most frequently, it's a list of genes. Uh, in the case of this assay, it's 152 genes. Sometimes, and it's important to recognize if this is true, sometimes a panel is only sequencing portions of genes. 
uh, for the solid tumor sequencing panel here, we're sequencing the entire coding sequence plus 10 base pairs into adjacent introns uh, in order to uh, ensure coverage of the whole exon. Typically, panels do not include non-coding variants like promoter variants unless it's otherwise stated. Now, many modern panels do go after TERT promoter mutations in particular, but they will say so in their methodology or on their website or however they're describing their assay. Uh, typically, panels do not include deep intronic sequence that you would need to sequence uh, in order to capture every kind of med exon skipping mutation or uh, rearrangement, chromosomal rearrangements, for example, unless it's stated otherwise. And there is such a thing as a hotspot panel. You may have heard the term hotspot uh, before. What a hotspot panel is, uh, is a narrowly focused panel that um, sequences only the regions of genes that are high yield. So for example, it wouldn't sequence all of KRAS, it would sequence um, most important, the most important loci like KRAS G12, G13, and uh, Q61. Um, we have a hotspot panel, which we call PPP for the pen precision panel. And uh, the genes on our hotspot panel are illustrated here in bold faced and underlined. Um, but again, it's important to recognize that not the entirety of those genes is sequenced. There are two technological approaches to library preparation that, are, that have broad penetration right now, and there are variants on a, on a theme. But remember, the idea of library selection is to pick out the DNA from the patient that you're most interested in sequencing and leave out everything else. And so the two approaches are called Amplicon and Capture Library Preparations. Let's imagine that the gold box represents a, an area of interest. We'll say it's the VRAF V600 codon that you want to sequence. In the Amplicon method, you design primers that bracket your region of interest, and you let a limited PCR reaction occur that duplicates that sequence in between. So it's pretty pretty much like a regular PCR, with the exception that no, normally PCR amplifies exponentially. And in amplicon chemistry, you try to control the amplification um, so that it, it doesn't go exponential. But otherwise, the chemistry is quite simple. In capture, you also uh, need to know what you want to target. So we can continue to imagine that this is the BRAP V600 locus. But you use a single probe that binds nearby. And that probe can be conjugated to uh, uh, some, uh, a moiety that binds something that can be pulled down. In this case, it's a magnetic bead. And when we apply a magnetic field, only um, DNA fragments that are bound to probe will be extracted from the solution. So the advantage of amplicon chemistry is that it's faster, essentially. Um, the uh, hybridization process for capture probes um, tends to take uh, quite a long time by comparison. Uh, and what you sacrifice, though, in order to get that speed is um, fidelity, uh, error rate. Um, the amplicon step, the amplification step, uh, uses polymerase, which introduces uh, an opportunity for errors. Uh, it introduces amplification bias, uh, etc. Um, so the capture methodology is slower, but uh, is more accurate. It has fewer false positives and false negatives. Uh, the coverage is more even because there is um, not as much uh, concern about amplification bias. Um, in, an important distinction or an important factor to be aware of is that amplicon chemistry limits your panel size considerably because the, if you've, again, if you've ever worked in a research lab and tried to mix different PCR probes together, uh, you know that um, it becomes very difficult to get uh, multiple PCR reactions to work properly in the same reaction mixture. 
And so there is a size limit for amplicon based um, assays uh, to the point where if you're doing whole exome or whole genome sequencing, or even a, a, a large enough panel, you have to be on capture. You, you don't have a choice. But if you do have a choice, uh, the choice again comes down to the, the triangle. Um, are you going to sacrifice quality in order to get rapid results, or are you going to have a slow, a slightly slower assay in order to get um, higher quality results? Library preparation, though, doesn't end at um, the uh, extraction of the sequences. The sequences need to be labeled. Um, we haven't talked about this, but um, specimens are mixed together in these reactions uh, in order to uh, keep costs low. Um, uh, we, on our setup, we sequence a couple dozen specimens at a time, for example. And the only way to do that is to tag the DNA with um, an index that is unique to each specimen that will then, um, during the sequencing and bioinformatics process, allow the downstream recognition of which fragments belong to which patient. We also add an adapter that uh, provides a, uh, a, a place for the matrix to bind to. And the matrix is, um, it sounds cooler than it is, it's either beads or a flow cell that um, uh, is essentially just uh, a place for the sequence to bind and sequencing to occur. And that's represented here by this uh, gold T shape. The adapter also provides a site for the polymerase to begin sequencing. Uh, and so once you have your library pre prepared and labeled, it can go on the machine and be sequenced. And that's a little cartoon of uh, what sequencing is like. It's the extension of the primer sequence, uh, nucleotide by nucleotide, um, in the machine. There are two commercial technologies uh, uh, available that uh, are, are currently prevalent in the marketplace. There's always the possibility of uh, others uh, coming down the pike, but at the moment, there are really two technologies that are worth considering. Uh, on the one hand, you have ionometric sequencing, which can be considered massively parallel pyro sequencing. I'll go over what that means in a second. And on the other hand, you have fluorometric sequencing, which would be equivalent to massively parallel Sanger sequencing. So with ionometric sequencing, you're progressively adding nucleotides. And each time you add a nucleotide, you give off a chemical byproduct. You give off two, actually. Uh, you give off pyrophosphate, which is what's detected by pyro sequencing. The pyrophosphate is used to generate a flash of light. Um, ionometric sequencing works exactly the same way. It just detects the hydrogen ion instead of the pyrophosphate. Fluorometric sequencing works like Sanger sequencing, which if you'll remember from a previous slide, uh, acts by a di-terminator reaction. So you add the labeled nucleotide uh, and it fluoresces with a color under laser light. In Sanger sequencing, that uh, sequence cannot extend. It's terminated and terminated permanently. And remember, we run it out on a gel to see how long it is. In fluorometric sequencing, we just reverse that termination signal. We cut it off and proceed with sequencing. And so rather than detecting by color and size, like traditional Sanger sequencing, fluorometric sequencing de detects color and timing. It, it literally detects the sequence at which you're adding the uh, nucleotides. So back to our schematic diagram of ionometric sequencing, if we have a very sensitive pH meter and we add an ATP, a hydrogen ion is evolved, and the pH meter detects it. CTP, GTP, et cetera, every time a hydrogen ion is evolved, the pH meter flashes. Importantly in this technique is to, or important to understand, 
is that every hydrogen ion looks exactly the same. It flashes exactly the same. And so um, in order to make this technique work, you need to know the um, sequence of nucleotides that you added to the chemical mixture. Fluorometric sequencing has uh, different constraints. It, you don't need to know the sequence because each nucleotide is individually labeled. So as a labeled nucleotide is incorporated, a laser flashes, causes the emission of um, uh, a signal, and we can repeat that over and over and over again. And if this cartoon is seeming tedious, that's intentional because one of the disadvantages of fluorometric sequencing is that uh, the chemical reversal, the chemical cleaving of the signal um, takes extra time. And so fluorometric sequencing is a slower technology than ionometric sequencing. Again, you sacrifice speed for quality though. Uh, ionometric sequencing, it tends to be a little bit more error prone. Um, there are methods that help correct for that, but at the end of the day, it's, it, it is slightly more error prone. Uh, interestingly, uh, ionometric platforms tend to be smaller um, and so they are more cost effective at low volumes. So um, if you literally have a low volume of tests ordered, or if you want to run your tests more often, uh, perhaps ionometric sequencing is a better strategy for your lab. On the other hand, fluorometric sequencing tends to be more cost effective at high volumes. These are larger machines, and so um, if you're if you're seeing uh, again literally high volume of ordering or you can afford to wait and fill up large um, machines uh, you might find fluorometric to be more cost effective and again we see the tension between speed and quality and cost Okay, just a few final words. Um, again, uh, you've heard me mention the term depth a few times. Depth is simply the number of times a given position is interrogated. It's a count of how often you've sequenced a given position in your assay. Whoops, didn't mean to go backwards. The mean depth is what it sounds like. It's the average number of times each position is sequenced. Sometimes people use those terms interchangeably. Here is a zoomed out view of IGV, and you can see that there is a depth view that you can um, visualize. Uh, this is an amplicon based panel, and this view of depth illustrates that some amplicons outperform other amplicons just by the nature of amplicon chemistry. That's uh, an illustration of it right there. So what do you get from having higher depth? From sequencing to a higher depth, you, uh, you can lower your limit of detection. Uh, and you can also improve the accuracy and precision of quantitation. What do I mean by quantitation? Uh, another term that I've introduced already but haven't defined is the variant allele fraction or the variant allele frequency, which is literally the number of times that you've detected a variant divided by the overall depth. It's just a ratio. And that's um, illustrated in words in this report here. The VAF roughly approximates one half of the tumor cellularity. People often take that to be um, more true than it is, though. There are some huge caveats, one of which is that, um, as I mentioned before, these assays are statistical in nature in a lot of ways. And so there's much more intra-assay variability uh, on these assays than there is in most laboratory uh, technology, for example, a cholesterol or a, chemist or a, a, a calcium. Uh, given um, certain choices in, in assay design, the intra-assay variability can be up to 15%, meaning if I tell you that um, the VAF of a given mutation in a given specimen is 30%, the real VAF could be as high as 45% or as low as 
the other thing to consider is that there may be concurrent cytogenetic alterations, um, particularly loss of the alternate allele. Um, we'll talk about this in an example in a second. So the first example I would give of a clinical scenario that people present me with all the time is uh, if we have patient um, uh, patient X, um, uh, that's bad because I've used X already. If we have patient um, Jones and um, patient Jones is sequenced three times over the course of a year at time X, uh, he or she has a mutation at 8%. At time Y, it's 13%, and at time Z, the same mutation is at 18%. And the clinician wants to know, is this patient worsening? Well, the first thing you have to ask is, was each biopsy equivalent, uh, if this is a solid tumor, was each biopsy equivalent? Maybe you just got more on the third, or, uh, maybe you just got progressively more tumor on your biopsy each time. Uh, in which case the numbers are sort of meaningless. Um, if you know that the tumor percentage was, let's say, 50% um, each time, um, then you would need to ask, what is the cytogenetic status at this locus? Is there um, perhaps loss of the alternate allele or gain of the allele that the mutation is on? And again, going back to the variability question, what is the variability of this assay? That might even be your first question, because if it's even 10%, not, we're not, let's leave 15% aside. If it's even 10%, there's no statistical difference between eight and 18%. And so the answer almost always is you don't know whether this patient is worsening. Similar example, but a different clinical scenario is uh, you have a patient with pancreatic cancer and a BRCA2 loss of function variant, BAF of 41%. In this case, you might use the intra-assay variability to justify the fact that that might be at 50%, which would be a heterozygous germline variant. Is that reasonable? At the end of the day, you don't know this either, because yes, that could be 50%, but it could also be 26%. Um, more importantly, in this case, BRCA2 is a, a, a tumor suppressor, meaning that the, uh, the purported mechanism of disease is loss of function of both alleles. And so if you have loss of function on one allele, you would expect the other allele to either have a mutation, in this case it doesn't, um, and so you would expect loss of the uh, entire cytogenetic locus if this is really driving the patient's disease. The only real way to distinguish somatic versus germline variants is to um, sequence both somatic or both the disease tissue and the germline tissue, and that naturally adds extra cost and complexity to your work. So we're going to stop there and we'll take questions uh, for a few minutes and talk about uh, bioinformatics and interpretation on Thursday. Thank you all for your attention. All right. Thank you, Dr. Rosenbaum. Let's move into questions. I'm going to take back control of the slides here. Let's get that done first. And once again, I'll just remind people part two is going to be on Thursday, same time, same place, same login. Uh, trying to grab my control back. I think I've got it. And you can, of course, follow Dr. Rosenbaum on Twitter at, at MopathGuy. All right, let's start moving through the questions that we received. And the first one is, can we use frozen section block to run NGS? You can. Um, the compromise that you're going to make there is in accuracy of the tumor content. Um, assessment. And so uh, you run the risk um, by having a lower grade histopathologic assessment of um, the material you actually send um, not having as much tumor as you thought. And so there's a, a little bit of a risk there, but we do sequence frozen um, sections under some circumstances at our institution. 
All right, we have a question. How can MPS still work on FFPE tissue when deamination occurs? So deamination occurs at a low rate, um, uh, such that, and, and it occurs at random. Um, uh, I'm, I'm not sure if that answers your question. Um, the, specifically, the deamination that occurs um, uh, it, 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 yeah, it, it occurs at, at a low enough rate that what it does is it um, restricts, it, it, it contributes to restricting the length of, uh, of a sequencing read, the, um, the length that a polymerase can go before it hits a problem and falls off. And that can be estimated statistically. And that's something I didn't address explicitly, but is true that um, the uh, formal and exposed tissues for that reason and others um, uh, usually requires shorter sequencing lengths, which has downstream consequences for the kinds of calls that can be identified. Okay, I'm going to shoot you a few quick uh, disambiguation or clarification questions. Yeah. First, Go. is low tumor cellularity the same as low tumor fraction? Yes. All right. Um, is SNV the same as SNP? No. Um, an SNP, a single nucleotide polymorphism, is explicitly something that is known to be a polymorphism in the population. That is, certain people inherit it. An SNV is a single nucleotide variant. Chemically, they're indistinguishable, but um, an SNV uh, may be an SNP, but you don't know. Uh, and an SNV can also include um, things that are known not to be inherited, like BRAP V600E or KRAS G12C. Okay. Are larger NGS panels always better than small ones? Uh, no, and I hope I got that across that um, it depends what it is you're trying to accomplish clinically. Um, a larger panel will get you more information, but if that information is all superfluous, uh, you've spent a lot of money and wasted a lot of effort, um, doesn't necessarily equate to turnaround time, but it can. Um, and so, no, a larger panel is not always better. Um, uh, a larger panel is only better if it gives you information that's useful. All right. Uh, let's see. How long can FFPE specimens remain viable for genomic testing, considering there is progressive degradation of the nucleic acid? It really, it, that, there's no simple answer to that question, and not, not enough work really has been done to establish what a reasonable time, time frame is. And it's also going to depend on the storage conditions. If, if the FFPE is stored, excuse me, um, in the cold, the chemical degradation goes slower and you can probably get away with sequencing older tissues. Whereas if it's just stored in a warehouse that's not climate controlled or something, um, you can expect a, a worsening of the degradation. So it, it, it's hard to set a hard and fast timeline. All right, I have a series of questions about archival blocks. If we have no option but to choose an archival block in a particular case, what's your advice? Well, I, I mean, if you have no option, then that's, that's your answer. I mean, um, <laughs> you, I, it uh, may be, this may have been actually, it's from the same person, so it may have been some disambiguation here on the question. RNA versus DNA-based analysis on an archival block, is that okay in continuation if it's stored under optimum conditions? Uh, it can, we can get RNA from archival tissue. It's a little bit dicier. You're gonna have to accept the, the fact that um, there's gonna be a pretty high failure rate. But one thing that you can do um, if you have good communication with your histology between your histology lab and your sequencing lab is to make sure that they take a deeper cut. They don't take the first cut off the specimen for the RNA test. Um, because the deeper you go into the block, the more likely the RNA is preserved. All right, now we get into some fuzzier areas. Uh, just looking for your opinion. 
First, your opinion on tumor enhancement techniques. Uh, what do you like? Manual macro dissection, manual micro dissection, laser capture micro dissection? I mean, I think I betrayed my bias. I like anything that has lasers in it. Um, uh, I think, um, again, it, it really depends on the clinical benefit. Um, if, if you're finding that you're sending enough, that you're experiencing enough specimens that um, have high admixture of non-tumoral cells, uh, so a lot of inflammatory specimens or a lot of um, maybe posse cellular specimens like um, uh, thyroid FNAs or something, um, where the selection of individual cells could really benefit patients, then laser capture, uh, micro dissection, that's, it's an extreme step to take because it's expensive and it adds time, but it may be worth it. Uh, under most circumstances, macro dissection is going to be adequate in my experience for clinical use. For research, it's a different question. All right. Perhaps a laser that could destroy an entire planet? Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> All right. Um, another, another general question. What do you find to be the most challenging specimens in obtaining adequate nucleic acids for genomic diagnosis? Uh, in our experience, the, the biggest challenge has actually been prostate biopsies, um, <clears throat> and that may be surprising, um, uh, but the reason is this. Um, prostate biopsies are not targeted usually. They're, they're blind biopsies, and so often um, you get uh, very little actual tumor um, on the biopsies, even if there are 12 little cores, uh, maybe only a couple of cores have tumor in them. And if you went ahead and extracted the whole specimen, you would have gotten enough DNA, but the tumor content would be too low. But on the other hand, if you macro dissect and try and select out only the tumor, then you'd, you're not left with enough DNA to proceed with the test. Um, the other problem with with prostates um, as a clinical scenario, not as a specimen per se, is that they often metastasize to bone. And as I indicated, decalcification uh, uh, ruins the DNA and prevents sequencing. Okay, I'm gonna do one last question and then let you get out of here so that you can prepare for your next lecture. Dr. Rosenbaum is in high demand today. Um, let's see, when would you think of and test uh, when would you think of doing genetic testing in surgical pathology just in general? How do we decide when it's a good idea? Uh, I would refer to um, whatever guidelines are available, whether they be NCCN or different subspecialty, like I mentioned in the talk, the IAS CLC for lung cancer. <clears throat> um, it's important to be familiar with those guidelines. Um, they will, they, they offer pretty well supported recommendations with evidence as to uh, what targets are worth um, sequencing and how, uh, how good the evidence is supporting that. And so again, for IAS CLC, um, the recommendations are um, for several genes to be sequenced and probably they'll need to be updated soon because there was just an FDA approval for MET uh, mutations and for RET fusions and now um, uh, a new recommendation for any tumor type, lung or anything else for TMB. So um, you could make the case now, uh, given uh, the pan tumor approvals by the FDA for TMB, MSI and NTRAC fusions, that every patient's tumor deserves sequencing just in case they qualify for an FDA approved therapy. All right, excellent. Well, as the saying goes, Dr. Rosenbaum, uh, we know we're going to see you back here on Thursday, so we shan't say adieu, we'll simply say au revoir and let you go off and refill your water bottle before your next lecture. Thank, Thank you, you so me. much, everybody. We look forward to seeing you back here on Thursday and we'll continue the talk on genomic pathology in practice. That's gonna conclude our session for today. Thank you, everybody. <laughs>